Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I see Matthew Stockton in his usual seat. Hello, Matthew. He never lets me leave people. <laughs> He's not allowed to leave. You, you like it here, I thought. I'm chained to the desk. <laughs> you like my kitties, apparently. The cats are the best. Yeah, Egg really likes you. He sits right on your lap. They're very soft. Yeah, they're very soft. They're like smooshy. they're like mink. Mink. You said sable earlier. Oh yeah, sable. Yeah, sable is nice. Sable is nicer than mink. But not how it's made. No, that's gross. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, Family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Between 1926 and 1928, a sinister darkness was afoot on a small chicken ranch in Wineville, California. Beginning when he was only 19 years old, Gordon Stewart Northcott, a Canadian, had abducted, raped, tortured, and murdered at least three and as many as 20 others. His victims were predominantly prepubescent boys. He sexually assaulted and released numerous others. When a portion of the truth came out, much of it was told by Northcott's nephew, 13-year-old Sanford Clark. Northcott had brought Sanford with him from Canada two years before. Gordon Stewart Northcott viciously raped and beat Clark numerous times before tiring of him as he aged. Afterward, through fear and intimidation, Northcott coerced his nephew into assisting him in committing and covering up the murders of his victims. Even Northcott's own mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, had assisted directly in some of the crimes in an effort to keep her son out of jail. It isn't clear how many youngsters Northcott killed. One of the cases many believe is tied to Northcott inspired the 2008 film Changeling, directed by Clint Eastwood. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 245, The Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. To try to understand Gordon Stewart Northcott, we first have to look at his parentage. Northcott's mother, Sarah Louise, who later dropped Sarah and went only by her middle name, was likely born on 26th of August, 1869 in Strathroy, Ontario. We say likely, as record-keeping was sparse, and Louise was a pathological liar. So much so, she might not have been clear on the correct year of her own birth. Regardless, she was born to William and Diana Carrothorpe, recent immigrants to Canada from Devonshire, England. Louise was known to have two sisters, one of whom, Rose, was still living in Strathroy when Louise was arrested for assisting her son with his crimes. Otherwise, little is known about the enigmatic woman prior to her marriage to Gordon Stewart's father, George Northcott. I wouldn't be surprised that she was from Strathroy. No? 
my hometown. That's right. All, I... <laughs> lots of troublemakers come out of my hometown. Yeah. We do. We really do punch above our weight in for serial murderers and terrorists. Serial murderers like. Remember the Mad Slasher episode? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and then we've had a few other ones. But what about terrorism? What's that about? Well, we had that dude that had strapped a bomb to himself and was trying to take a taxi to a shopping mall or something in London and blew, blew up the taxi. Oh, yeah. And then recently that guy that mowed down a family yeah. in London, Ontario, he had Strathroy connections as well. Oh, man. You guys are crazy there in Strathroy. Something in the water, maybe. I think maybe. there's something in the water. Yeah. Cyrus George Northcott was born on 18 September 1866 in London, Ontario, but his parentage is unclear. Again, thanks to poor record keeping in the era. But it's most likely his parents were local farmers Augustus and Carolyn Northcott. George grew up in southwestern Ontario and had two brothers, Thomas and Ephraim, both of whom eventually moved to New York. George and Louise were married on the 12th of August, 1886. Their first child, Winifred Winnie, who would later become Sanford Clark's mother, was born a few years after the Northcotts wed. There were other children born between Gordon Stewart and Winnie, five in all, but none of them lived past childhood. One boy, Louise's second child, Willie, was six when he died of pneumonia. The others died nameless in early infancy. Many reports indicate that both George and Louise struggled with psychological and physical ailments galore. Theirs was not a happy home, in fact, far from it, as there are stories of horrific, protracted bouts of domestic violence occurring between the couple. The Northcott's often tumultuous marriage had gone on 20 years when Gordon Stewart Northcott was born in Bladworth, Saskatchewan on the 9th of November, 1906. His family called him Stewart. According to James Jeffrey Paul's book, Nothing is Strange with You, the Northcott's daughter Winnie, often witness to the goings-on between her parents, later sent a 3,000-word telegram to Stewart's lawyers to give the court an idea of life in their childhood home and insight into Louise's relationship with Stewart. George was a man of highly nervous temperament, of a violent, uncontrollable temper, and suffered from severe headaches. She said that he was an avowed atheist while Northcott's mother came from a very religious stock, even religious to a point of fanaticism, very romantic, and had a most vivid imagination. When children were coming, George and Louise both rebelled at the thoughts of the trouble and restrictions that parenthood would impose upon them. They were separated after five years of married life, but came together again when Willie, the second child, died of pneumonia. Louise was deranged at this time and cried continuously, I will curse God and die. He has taken my baby. When later Ms. Northcott discovered that she was again an expectant mother, her rage knew no bounds. Her husband advised her to destroy the unborn child at all costs. This Mrs. Northcott tried to do by violently jumping, excessive horse riding, and many other measures. Two months before the child was born, Mrs. Northcott was kicked by her husband in a rage, which injured her spine. When Gordon Stewart was born, his mother at first refused to look at him, then suddenly became obsessed in her devotion to him. He had everything he wanted, and no discipline was ever exercised over him. The consequence was that the slightest discipline threw him into a paroxysm of rage. He lived in a world of dreams and was a world unto himself." End quote. So not born into the most stable of environments, no, I guess. No. Kind of an understatement. Yeah, it sounds like... Uh, they what? sound like nutcases. <laughs> like really crazy people. Just just horrible. If this was true... Horrible human beings. Yeah, these people were not good folks. No. If this is all true. It is. <laughs> <laughs> when Stuart was a baby, his elder sister Winnie married John Clark. Their daughter, Jessie, was born in 1909, and their son, Sanford Wesley, later tortured mercilessly by his uncle Stuart, was born on March 1, 1913, when he had two more boys, Kenneth and Edwin, born in the years following. In 1913, the Northcott family moved to Vancouver, where they would live for the next 11 years. While here in the Lower Mainland, Stuart developed a love of music, both classical and jazz music of the day. His favorite classical composers were Beethoven and Debussy, he studied the lives of composers and dove headlong into their music as well, learning to play the piano, which he took to like a duck to water. Eventually, he became proficient enough at playing the instrument he was able to earn cash, playing in cafes, 
and is a member of a jazz orchestra led by himself. Debussy. Yeah. Claire de Lune is one of my yeah, favorite I pieces. Yeah, I love that piece. Isn't that a gorgeous piece? Yeah, it really is. I like jazz as well, but Justin calls jazz mu music the equivalent of nails on a chalkboard. Well, it depends on the jazz, like really. Because yeah, some, like, some jazz, if they're riffing, yeah. I'm kind of not into it. But oh, I love, I love when they do that. Yeah. <laughs> I like my music a little more melodic. I think I just scared your cats in the other room. Oh, yeah, they're probably <laughs> having little kitty heart attacks over there. In 1918, Stewart suffered a serious head injury after a nasty slip and fall accident on a patch of ice. It was reported that as a result of the fall, he'd had brain hemorrhages and that for some weeks after the incident, his, quote, mind was unbalanced and he was not quite right thereafter. There's no further detail about the injury, but head injuries have been pointed to as a rather common factor in serial killers. Some of the most infamous were known to have had head injuries in childhood. Dennis Rader, a.k.a. BTK, revealed in his biography that, as an infant, his mother had accidentally dropped him on his head. Notorious liar Henry Lee Lucas recalled his mother smashing a piece of wood over his head when he was seven years old. Ed Gein claimed that his mother, a violent alcoholic, would repeatedly beat him so hard as a child that his ears would ring. With trauma to the brain from constant beatings, Gein suffered from a lazy eye and speech impairment. Serial child killer Albert Fish was known to have fallen from a tree causing a concussion that resulted in headaches and dizzy spells throughout his life. As well as murdering and eating children, Fish also had a habit of shoving straight pins and needles into his taint, proven out later by an x-ray that revealed what remained of 29 metal needles buried inside his body. It isn't clear whether head injuries are relevant to the development of serial killers or merely just coincidence shared by almost every kid. I'm pretty sure we all have a story or two. Take, for example, my own various childhood head injuries. After an argument over the ownership of a Tonka dump truck, when we were four or five, my childhood friend Peter Simmons bonked me over the head with the sharp end of a metal toy snow shovel. I needed stitches and still have the scar in my hairline. In another incident, even before that, I tumbled down the basement stairs in my walker and whacked my head hard on the concrete floor, knocking me senseless. It was that incident that prompted Dad to put a chain lock on the basement door off the kitchen. I haven't killed anyone, nor do I have any strange obsessions that I can think of right now other than buying way too many books and movies. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting beside piles of your books at the moment. Yes, I had, I fell from the hayloft and was knocked out cold and had massive concussion and loss of memory and issues, but I'm not a serial killer. That we know of. Yeah. I mean, I keep my murderous rages to myself. Right. And as you should. Yeah. 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 It's polite. Also around the time of Stuart Northcott's head injury during the influenza pandemic that took place between 1918 and 1919, he came down with a nasty case of what was then called the Spanish flu. As I wrote in my book, the flu had killed many, even strong and strapping youngsters like Stuart. Things were touch and go for a time. Stuart's fever was astronomically high, but he eventually recovered. This also could have affected his brain. Regardless of physical causes, Stuart was a bit of an oddball with a number of strange obsessions. In Cold North Killers, author Lee Meller mentions one of these obsessions. Meller writes, quote, when Stuart grew to manhood, however, he began to demonstrate a number of peculiarities. First and foremost was the heavy carpet of body hair that appeared with puberty, causing the vain youth to spend his life seeking a cure. Later, his father George would jokingly refer to him as the Ape Man, a moniker adopted and adapted by the press in the wake of the Wineville murders. End quote. There was a darker proclivity, too. When Stuart was just 15, while visiting Kamloops, he got into the type of trouble that would later drive him into his heinous crimes. He was accused of attempting to molest a 10-year-old boy. For reasons unknown, in August of 1924, when Stuart was 17, the Northcott family pulled up stakes and moved south, leaving Canada for sunny California. From James Jeffrey Paul's book, Nothing is Strange with You, quote, Perhaps they had fallen on hard times and work was more plentiful in the States, or perhaps they simply wanted a change of scenery. At any rate, George found work as a contractor and builder 
while Louise worked in the laundry of the Los Angeles County General Hospital. As for Stewart, he would claim that he, quote, clerked part-time in a store and attended school, and that, quote, I also sold automobiles for a time. During the next four years, George and Louise lived in at least four different locations in Los Angeles, probably more, but finally settled into a house at 1239 Britannia Street, end quote. Perhaps the motive for the move was Gordon Stewart Northcott's problem, the fact that he liked to molest children. But as the old saying goes, no matter where you go, there you are. Gordon Stewart Northcott's problems came right along with him to California. It didn't take long before Stewart got into the same sort of trouble that had first publicly reared its head in Kamloops. At school, Stewart made friends with a youth his own age and was soon spending time at the young man's home. It was there that Stewart sexually abused the friend's prepubescent brother, who told his parents, who in turn called the police. Stewart was arrested and charged with statutory rape, but there are varying reports about what happened next. Some indicate that the charges were dropped, and others say that he was given probation. For sure, though, he was not given any jail time. It wasn't until after his arrest for the murders that something else came out about Gordon Stewart Northcott. From James Jeffrey Paul's book, Nothing is Strange with You, quote, After Stewart became infamous, residents of Pasadena Avenue's Arroyo Seco district said that he had been involved in a, quote, notorious homosexual scandal in the neighborhood in 1926, in which four boys had been arrested. Stewart's name had not been connected with the case at the time, but residents claimed to remember his connection with the scandal and his reputation as the Sheik of Pasadena Avenue. At the time, Stewart had been living with his parents on Avenue 34. A notorious homosexual scandal, eh? Yeah. Well, weren't they all notorious? No, whenever somebody's like arrested for doing horrible things to children, then they're, oh, but there's this homosexual scandal he was involved in, like connecting it all. Yeah. I, I think I'm a, notor I'm a walking notorious homosexual scandal. <laughs> I would say that's correct. <laughs> But you're not a killer, again. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a lover, not a killer. You're just a homosexual <laughs> scandal. Al Bernier, Stewart's boss at the grocery store where he worked in the summer and fall of 1925, recalled young Northcott as a weirdo and a liar who told bizarre stories. He even told people that his mother had been run down by a car and killed. Coincidentally, someone who figures later in this story, a little boy only seven years old at the time named Walter Collins, was a regular customer in the store. Northcott interacted with, with the precocious young Walter often when he came into the store to pick up his mother's grocery orders. Two years later, Walter would be presumed to be one of Stewart's victims out at that chicken ranch. Ominously, a neighbor of Stewart's later recalled the young man obsessively chatting about his knowledge of how to dispose of human bodies. He said that using quicklime and graves would rapidly break down the bones, a practice later proven as part of Stewart's M.O. It was spring of 1926 when 19-year-old Stewart went to his father with a request. He wanted George to buy him a three-acre parcel of land out in Wineville, in Riverside County, in which Stewart had become interested. He wanted to start a small chicken ranch and gain some independence, have a place of his own away from his parents. It would provide him the privacy he needed to do the things he really wanted to do. George agreed and bought the property for his son. Later, George helped him to build the shack where Stewart lived and the chicken coop that would become a place of horror. Stewart hated physical labor, so he decided he needed help and knew just the person for it. His sister Winnie's kid, 13-year-old Sanford. Stewart hopped in his car and set out for Saskatchewan to convince Winnie to let Sanford come back to California with him. More after a quick break. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts? So he had got no jail time in Canada. Nope, and then none. in the U.S., the authorities didn't kick him out of the country. Nope. And we see this again and again and again and again. Yeah. Right? It's like, and maybe it's changed now. Like, if you're trying to diddle somebody, there should be, there should be very clear mark, right? Even if you're younger. Like a very clear report. Mm. Because what we see all the time 
is people get away with it and then it turns into this horrific 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 yeah situation over time mm -hmm. like there there has to be like you know like no room i don't know no room for letting people go because the first things they do maybe not so bad in some people's eyes until they get to this point what am i saying like put on a computer system so just recently yeah the supreme court of canada declared parts of the sex offender register unconstitutional why? So in a recent ruling, the Supreme Court of Canada said, while mandatory registration has the attraction of simplicity and ease, the convenience requiring every sex offender to register does not make it constitutional. They said, the registry is nearly 20 years old, and despite its long existence, there is little or no concrete evidence of the extent which it assists police in the prevention and investigation of sex offenses. So offenders have to report to police if they change their address, travel, or try to obtain a driver's license or passport. And if they're on this registry, they may be contacted by the police at any time. So there's a stigma that it brings, as well as some evidence that is simply being listed increases the chance of reoffending. They also wrote, The impact of a registry order on an offender's liberty can only fairly be described as serious. So they believe that these guys shouldn't be on the registry for life. Mm. So now people are going to be able to apply to have their names removed. Mm. Whether or not I agree with that is one thing, but, but yes, interesting. The whole thing stems from one person who was convicted of two different assaults in 2011, but now wants to move on with his life uh, and be removed from this registry, which he says is affecting him in earning a living, and he claims he's having his rights and freedoms infringed upon, and the court agreed with him. Some of what happens in the second half of this episode comes from stories later told by Gordon Stewart Northcott's nephew Sanford Clark. His story is given in vivid detail in author Anthony Flacco's book, The Road Out of Hell, Sanford Clark and the True Story of the Wineville Murders. Check it out, it's worth a read. Stewart spent two weeks at Winnie's Place in Saskatoon. Out of his sister's four children, he most fancied the older boys, 11-year-old Kenneth and 13-year-old Sanford. He wanted one of them to come along with him and tried to convince either boy, promising adventure, but neither took the bait. Something told them both that Stewart was unsafe to be alone with. He gave them the creeps, but neither really knew why, not then anyway. Finally, after a number of whispered conversations with Winnie, Stewart had settled on Sanford as the one who'd accompany him. Winnie and Stewart told Sanford he'd be going to Regina, the provincial capital. There, Stewart claimed they'd look for signs of the devastation of the Regina hurricane. Sanford thought that was odd as the windstorm had happened 14 years ago, and even at 13, he knew it had been cleaned up a long time ago. Sanford was already keen to his mother's proficiency at slinging bullshit as well. He could see right through the lies Stuart and Winnie were telling him to try and get him to go along with his creepy uncle. Sanford looked to his father, John Clark, for help, but he had nothing to say. Winnie wore the pants in the family, and if she made a decision about something, that was the way it was. Sanford tried begging, but Winnie angrily told him that he was going with Stuart, and that's all there was to it. Sanford considered running away at that point, but soon became resigned to his fate. Sanford packed a small bag, and after a hug from his older sister Jessie, got into Stewart's car and they drove off. Their destination changed as they drove. Some reports say Stewart told Sanford they were now off to Vancouver, but he soon admitted that they were on their way to California and Stewart's chicken ranch in Wineville outside of L.A. After 12 hours of driving, they crossed the border in Montana, Stewart lied to the U.S. border guards, and they were off again. Stewart egotistically ranted about one thing or another to his captive audience, Sanford. If Stewart felt Sanford was not listening to or understanding what he was on about, Sanford would get punched or slapped hard. This was only a hint of the violence he'd have to endure for the next two years. The regular sexual assaults began soon after they arrived at Stewart's small ranch. Sanford Clark's sister, Jessie, now 19, was worried about her younger brother. He had been gone a long time, more than two years, and she had not spoken with him. The letters he'd sent were weird. He said he was doing well, but Jessie didn't buy it. 
although in Sanford's hand, they had a strange tone. There were words in them that she'd never heard Sanford use. Perhaps things were not okay. Maybe, she thought, Stuart was dictating the letters to Sanford. Jesse began planning a visit to California so she could find out for herself. But what about the parents? Well, so wasn't this kid supposed to have just gone away for a little while and suddenly he's like permanently gone for a couple of years? The idea is that Gordon Stewart Northcott worked out with Winnie, whom he had a very strange relationship with. Right. That Sanford should come along with him to California. So it had all been pre-planned. Sanford was going with him to work on the farm. So, you know, Sanford is sending letters, but there was never any phone calls. There was never any real actual contact. So that's why Jessie, who really did care about her little brother, thought something isn't right here. Yeah. In late July of 1928, after saving her money to make the trip, Jessie arrived in Los Angeles by train. Upon getting to the ranch, she was shocked at the state that Sanford was in. Although now 15, he somehow looked smaller and thinner than when he'd left. He was dirty, and worst of all, he seemed sullen and haunted, not at all the picture of the happy youth that his letters had painted. It was hard to get a second alone with Sanford. Stuart always seemed to be there. Even when they had some brief moments together, at first Sanford wasn't talking. He seemed afraid to say much. Jesse asked whether Stuart had done something to him, but Sanford initially denied that there was any problem. Jesse stayed at the ranch for a week. Over a few days, the truth began to leak out as Jesse's loving presence softened Stuart's grip over Sanford. The 15-year-old admitted that Stuart had, in fact, as Jesse had suspected, dictated Sanford's letters home. Sanford admitted that he was terrified of Stuart and that Jesse could be in danger, but he refused to elaborate right away. One night, after he was sure Stuart was asleep in another room, Sanford spilled the beans. Jesse heard how her little brother had been beaten and whipped regularly. Sanford said that Stuart had worked him to exhaustion on the ranch, never lifting a finger to do any of the chores himself. Jesse's head swam as Sanford told her of his being sodomized and molested by their uncle countless times. Stuart had done it to other boys too, but the worst was yet to come. There had been murders, one of a young Mexican man and other little boys. Stuart had forced Sanford to help him to dispose of the bodies. Jesse decided that she'd get Sanford out of there, no matter what, but had no idea how. The ranch was remote, and there were no neighbors close by. Stuart would easily catch them in his car if they ran. Over the next couple of days, she watched closely. Stuart's facade of the kind uncle slipped. Stuart hit Sanford in the head on one occasion with way too much force. He forgot himself and began saying terrible things. According to Lee Meller's Cold North Killers, quote, On another occasion, he openly bragged to her of his plans to make a sex slave of local boy Stephen Black, as Sanford was, quote, getting to be a big rough man, end quote. At Jesse's insistence, Stuart drove the trio to visit his parents in L.A., and while Stuart was in the washroom, Jesse and Sanford fled, running to the home of a local friend that Jesse had made and of which Stuart was unaware. Stuart's parents, however, knew about the friend and told Stuart, who immediately went to retrieve Sanford, taking him back to the ranch and leaving Jesse there. Jesse stayed in L.A. trying to figure out a way to safely get Sanford away from Stuart. Days later, Stuart himself provided her with an opportunity when he went alone on a trip to San Diego. When Louise was out, Jesse convinced her grandfather to drive to the ranch to gather Sanford so she could flee with him, but Stuart returned before they could run. Learning of Jesse's plot to abscond with Sanford, Stuart punched Jesse in the face, knocking her down. He threatened her and told her it best she left for Canada on her own. Fearing for her life in that moment, she lied to Stuart, agreeing to tell her parents Sanford was healthy and doing well at school. Sanford hadn't been to school in two years. As she left, Jesse hugged her brother, slipped some cash into his hand, and told him to take a bus from Wineville to L.A. where she would meet him, but he didn't appear at the agreed meeting spot. She learned later that Stuart had discovered the plot and threatened to kill Sanford if he did not remain at the farm. Jesse returned to Canada by train, and when she arrived in Vancouver, she told authorities how Gordon Stuart Northcott had taken her brother Sanford illegally into the United States where he'd molested him, and committed the murders of others whom he'd also molested and tortured. 
ever paranoid, Stuart knew that Jessie would most likely not keep her promise. So when police drove onto the ranch, he fled out of the back and across the fields thinking that he'd been found out, leaving Sanford alone. The cops were there to speak with Norcott on another matter, though, a car accident in which Stuart had been involved. Sanford saw his opportunity and told police about the murders and his own torture and molestation. The officers took Sanford to a juvenile facility in L.A., and over the next few days, horrific details of Gordon Stewart Northcott's activities emerged, including Sanford seeing a freshly severed head in a bucket belonging to one of Northcott's victims, a young Mexican man. Sanford told cops that he'd been tasked with feeding boys that Northcott had abducted. He also admitted, in fear of his own life, to having helped his uncle dispose of the bodies. Even more shocking, Sanford told police that his grandmother Louise had been involved in at least one of the murders, forcing Sanford to deliver a death blow to the boy with an axe. Police believed Sanford and went to arrest Stewart and Louise, but they had fled together, presumably across the border into Canada. Sanford was given photos of missing children to look at and identified a few he believed he'd seen at the ranch. One picture was, Sanford said, of the boy who he claimed that his grandmother had hit with an axe, the same child she'd forced Sanford to hit as well. This was Walter Collins, the boy mentioned previously, who'd frequented the grocery store at which Northcott worked. On March 28, 1928, Nine-year-old Walter Collins left home wearing a lumber jacket, brown corduroy trousers, black Oxfords, and a gray cap. He was going to see a movie in Mount Washington, a neighborhood of Los Angeles. Walter never came home. Walter's mother, Christine Collins, a telephone operator, reported him missing five days later on March 15th. In August, Illinois police picked up a runaway boy who sort of matched Walter's description. The boy told authorities he was Walter Collins and gave a, quote, hazy story about his abduction. The youngster spoke to Christine Collins over the phone and she paid $70 to bring him back to Los Angeles. As soon as the boy got off the train, right away Christine said she didn't believe this was her son. He looked smaller and quite different. Christine reluctantly agreed to take the boy home. She later claimed that police had ridiculed her for having doubts about the identity of the youngster. Police had been under enormous pressure to find the Collins boy and had arranged for media to cover the reunion. But when Christine balked, she was told this was definitely her son and that she was wrong. The boy stayed with her for three weeks and she became convinced this was not Walter. The youngster was an inch shorter than her son. She used Walter's dental records to prove that this was a different person. Christine went to police and told them her story. She said even though the boy called her Ma and looked a bit like Walter, she was sure it wasn't him. Police were unwilling to admit they'd made a mistake and due to public pressure to close the case, continued to insist this was Walter. They conducted a series of dubious tests to prove the boy was Walter Collins. They had the boy find his way back home from memory and brought in Walter's pet dog who allegedly recognized the boy as its owner. Christine continued insisting the boy wasn't her son. Rather than listen, cops told Christine she was perhaps mentally ill. She was forcibly committed to the Los Angeles County General Hospital Psychiatric Ward on September 8th. While Christine sat in the psych ward, cops again spoke to the boy that Illinois police had picked up and who'd told them he was Walter Collins. The boy finally admitted he wasn't Walter at all, and he told him his true name was Arthur Hutchins. This is absolutely outrageous. Yeah, really. That a woman who's like, this is just, this isn't my son. Yeah. The police are like, oh, you're insane because they want to close the case. Mm hmm Absolutely outrageous. So crazy. Yeah. It is, it's bonkers. It was so bonkers. Uh, I'll talk about it later. They made a movie about it. Oh. Arthur Hutchins admitted that after his own mother died, he'd run away from his father and stepmother. He was hitchhiking around the U.S., when in a DeKalb, Illinois cafe, someone told him he resembled a missing boy from Los Angeles. When he was picked up, juvenile authorities were skeptical about his story, but police were so desperate to close the Collins case that they insisted on its veracity. As for why Arthur lied, the 12-year-old told authorities he wanted to go to Hollywood to meet cowboy actor Tom Mix. 
Christine was released from the psych ward on September 13th and sued the LAPD. Captain J.J. Jones was one of the officers involved in the department's denial and responsible for locking up Christine. He was temporarily suspended from duty by the LAPD. After his reinstatement, he was later ordered to pay Christine $10,800 for damages for abuse of power and emotional pain she'd suffered under his custody. Jones never paid. Meanwhile, the real Walter Collins was still missing. Angelina Jolie played Christine Collins in the 2008 Clint Eastwood film, Changeling. Oh, I never... Have, have you seen it? I have, yeah. I quite I liked have it. not. Was it a good film? It's not a bad film. It's, okay. it's really hard to believe that it's a true story. But it is. It's based on a true story. I mean, there's always a bit of Hollywoodization to things, but it is absolutely based on this story. It's bonkers. That's insane. From Lee Meller's Cold North Killers, over the next few months, a meticulous search of the property revealed blood-soaked soil, a cap belonging to Nelson Winslow, one of the missing L.A. boys, finger, hand, and foot bones, toenails, flesh, hair, teeth, and an axe caked in blood. Sanford Clark said the axe had been used on human prey as well as chickens. Meller continues, Warrants were immediately issued for the arrest of Gordon Stewart Northcott and his mother Louise. Canadian authorities apprehended the slippery pederast on a train heading from the Okanagan Landing in British Columbia to the United States. Louise Northcott was captured shortly after, aboard a transcontinental train in Calgary, Alberta. But the show was just beginning. End quote. Stewart and his mother were extradited back to the United States to stand trial. Prior to his return, Stuart Gordon Northcott gave his story to the Vancouver Daily Sun. Northcott, true to form, denied his role in any murders and spun a tale of bullshit. Quote, There have been a lot of stories circulated about me. They were all untrue. What awful things to say about a man. Some people have been suffering from too much imagination, and a lot of people will be sorry when this case is cleared up. He claimed Louise knew nothing of the charges. Northcott continued, I had to protect poor little mother from this. I simply could not tell her of this. I simply could not tell her of what they were accusing me. If poor little mother had known of these charges, it would have killed her. So I kept it all from her. Newspapers and everything, I was forced to hide them. I wanted to get her away to a safe place. Then I intended to go back alone and fight this thing. End quote. Sarah Louise Northcott was not so innocent. Upon her return from Canada, she confessed in late 1928 to her participation in the murder of Walter Collins and pled guilty to the crime. Superior Court Judge Morton sentenced Louise to life imprisonment on December 31, 1928, sparing her from execution because she was a woman. Sanford bravely testified against his grandmother, telling his story of her involvement in one of the murders at her sentencing. It was she, Sanford said, who'd bashed little Walter Collins' head in with an axe handle and then had forced him to deliver the death blow. Louise later recanted her confession and claimed that she nor anyone else in her family had killed little Walter Collins. Sanford, she said, had made the whole thing up. Much to Christine Collins' disappointment, the state chose not to prosecute Gordon Northcott for Walter's murder feeling that the hearsay and witness evidence would not be enough to convict him, especially as his mother had now recanted her confession. The state of California instead brought him to trial for the murders of three others for which there was more forensic evidence. At the outset of his trial, that began on January 2, 1929, Stewart wanted to change his plea from not guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity, but the judge declined to alter the initial plea. Northcott's trial was held before Judge George R. Freeman in Riverside County, California, only miles away from the chicken ranch. As well as hearing about the murder of the headless Mexican in early 1928, the jury heard that he kidnapped, molested, tortured, and murdered the Winslow brothers, Lewis, age 12, and Nelson, age 10. They were the sons of Mr. and Mrs. Nelson H. Winslow, Sr. They went missing on May 16, 1928, from Pomona, California. On May 26, 1928, H. Gordon Moore, a local scoutmaster, reported that they ran away to Imperial, California to pick cantaloupes and help with the search for the two boys. 
Northcott's ego would not allow for anyone else to defend him without his direct involvement. He demanded to be allowed to question and cross-examine witnesses, one of whom was Sanford, who again was stalwart. Although still terrified of his uncle who was openly laughing at him in court and calling him a liar, he stayed on course and gave his testimony about the murders of the Winslow brothers who had been raped repeatedly while alive and then dispatched with an axe handle and then buried in the ranch, still barely alive. On February 8, 1929, the 27-day trial ended with Northcott being convicted of those three murders. Before Northcott's sentencing, Nelson Winslow Sr. led a lynch mob with the intent of hanging Northcott. The police convinced the group to disband before seeing him. On February 13th, Freeman sentenced Gordon Stewart Northcott to death. According to Michael Newton's An Encyclopedia of Modern Serial Killers, quote, Marking time at San Quentin, Northcott alternated between protestations of, of innocence and detailed confessions to the murder of 18 or 19, maybe 20, victims. A pathological liar who cherished the spotlight, he several times offered to point out remains of more victims, always reneging at the last moment. Northcott also named several of his wealthy customers at the ranch. There were claims that wealthy local pedophiles were paying Northcott for use of the boys whom he'd abducted, but their identities were never published. Warden Duffy recalled his conversations with Northcott as, quote, a lurid account of mass murder, sodomy, oral copulation, and torture so vivid it made my flesh creep, end quote. Despite Northcott's convictions, he continued to deny killing Walter Collins. As Louise Northcott had attempted to rescind her confession and gave other scattered and inconsistent statements, and Walter's remains have never been found, it isn't 100% certain that he died on Northcott's ranch. Christine Collins held out hope, choosing to believe her son was still alive. She corresponded with Gordon Northcott and received permission to interview him shortly before his execution. Northcott pledged to explain the true account of her son's fate, but he recanted at the last minute and professed his innocence of any involvement. Christine Collins was further encouraged by the appearance of another boy that Northcott had abducted and probably molested. Gordon Stewart Northcott mounted the gallows on October 2, 1930, breaking down and sobbing in the face of death. Before the trap was sprung, he screamed, A prayer! Please say a prayer for me! His mother subsequently died in prison of old age. Christine Collins continued to search for Walter for the rest of her life. She attempted several times to collect the money owed to her by J.J. Jones, including a 1941 court case in which she attempted to collect a $15,562 judgment in the Superior Court. She died in 1964, not knowing Walter's true fate. Christine was buried in Los Angeles. On November 1, 1930, Wineville, in large part because of the negative publicity surrounding the murders, changed his name to Mira Loma. According to a December 2008 article in the Whittier Daily News, after all he'd been through, Sanford Clark had led an exemplary life, although he'd been deeply affected. Clark wasn't tried, but was sentenced to five years at the Whittier State School, which was later renamed the Fred C. Nellis Youth Correctional Facility. Author Anthony Flacco said, Clark was there for 23 months and after his release, deported back to Canada. He served in World War II, married, and worked 28 years for the Canadian Postal Service. He and his wife June adopted and raised two sons. The couple were married for 55 years and were involved in different organizations. Clark died in 1991, end quote. Sanford Clark never intended to tell his children about what he'd gone through, but when his son Jerry was 17, he changed his mind. On the way home from a hockey game, Sanford pulled the car over and told Jerry what had happened so long ago. Sanford was concerned that people who'd remembered, that people who remembered what had happened with his uncle Stuart would think that Sanford was responsible for a recent murder in Saskatoon. It was that of 23-year-old nurse and former beauty queen Alexandra Vivjuruk, the girl from Saskatoon who we talked about in episode 158 of Dark Poutine. He chose to tell Jerry preemptively about his past in case the boy later heard from other kids at school. The comparisons never came, but now Jerry knew what his father had been through. 
It was this knowledge that later prompted Jerry Clark to be involved with Anthony Flacco's writing of the book about Stuart Northcott and Jerry's dad, The Road Out of Hell. He was carrying so much shame and guilt mm -hmm. from something that happened to him when he was a little kid where he was, he was a victim. He was absolutely 100% a yeah, victim. Decades later, and he's carrying that shame and guilt. Yep. And he carried it for the rest of his life, and we'll get into that. From the 2008 Whittier Daily News article by Ruby Gonzalez. One time when Clark wasn't at the dinner table, June Clark found him in his room with a gun in his hand. Author Anthony Flacco said June took the gun, smacked her husband, and told him to go down and have dinner, end quote. Apparently, he blamed himself right up until the very end. According to Ruby Gonzalez's article, when Jerry Clark told his dying father he loved him, Sanford's last words were, Why would you? That's so painful. That's sad. That is so sad. There's the result of trauma. Right to the end. Right to his the very end. His last words are, Why would you love me? Mm -hmm. So his, he essentially suffered a life sentence. Yeah, absolutely. While Gordon Stewart Northcott was snuffed out two years after, you know, he didn't have to suffer. This is kind of why I think life imprisonment is a better deal than taking somebody's life. Right. Because whether or not they agonize over what they've done, they're suffering because of it. Right. You know, they are suffering a lack of freedom because of it. Right. That's it for Dark Poutine episode 245, The Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So we did have one voicemail, but we're not going to play it because the person gives their phone number in it. But yeah, if you want to get in contact with the show, the best way to do it is darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. He said he couldn't find the email address yeah. on the website. It's very plainly yeah, there. Yeah, maybe he's like me. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I totally missed the office. If you sometimes. found the phone number, it's mm. right above the phone it's, number. Good. So Dark Poutine, what's the email again? Darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Send the story idea to there. Yeah, That'd please. Great. Yeah, love to hear it. And that's it for voicemails because we didn't have any. But call us. What should people call us and talk to us about, Matthew? The loud upstairs neighbors. Oh, well, yeah. No, I will talk about those. The because squeaky McSqueakertons. The, the, the McSqueakertons who live upstairs. <laughs> this building fucking sucks. <laughs> but if I, if I could afford to move, I would. But I can't, so I won't. <laughs> oh, so man. now we, we suffer the squeaky floors. Now we above. suffer the squeaks. Anyway, so if you do hear squeaks and bangs in the, in, during the show. It's the bloody neighbors. Yeah, we have tried to edit around it, but sometimes it's just, you know, you got to hold your nose and go. Literally, sometimes Mike and I sit here for like 10 minutes waiting for them to like stop. It's I think doing maybe jumping jacks on the floor. They might have a bowling alley up there. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure what's going on. Ah, uh, well, such is life. I know they're not doing it on purpose. They're just living their life. Yeah, just living their lives. But it's it's irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Don't irritate me with your life. <laughs> Too funny. Oh, boy. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Now it's on to a Patreon. Wow, here we go. We have two patrons and one Donut Money donor this week. First up, we have Janice Thompson, and Janice is from Oshawa, Ontario. The Dirty Schwa, apparently, my friend Paul calls it. My own private Oshawa. My own private Oshawa. And what does Janice do there in Oshawa, Ontario, Matthew, an area I'm sure you're familiar with. The Oshawa? Yes. What does she do there? Yeah. She owned the Oshawa Car Washawa. <laughs> the Car Washawa in Oshawa. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> if, no if nobody owns the Car Washawa in Oshawa, you should actually create one because that's At pretty the funny. Car Washawa. <laughs> in Oshawa. That's really funny. Well, thank you very much, Janice. Thank you, Janice. Next up, we have Sylvie, Sylvie Stewart, and she's from Merrimacook in New Brunswick. 
New Brunswick. Nouveau Brunswick. Nouveau Brunswick. Yeah, I love New Brunswick. Uh, what does Sylvie do there in Merrimacook? She's a ballet dancer. She's a ballet dancer? Yeah, one of, one of the best ballet dancers that ever lived. Her name was Sylvie, so I'm, oh. I'm thinking that maybe she's her daughter or something. Oh, you're mumbling again. Or is she's her daughter or something? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, is there is there a big uh, um, ba Ball <laughs> ballet school in Merriman Merrimacook? Mar 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 no, Mar I don't. I don't believe there is. But have, it, have there you might been? Be. Have you been to Merrimacook? No, I am making an assumption. So I might a hundred percent be wrong. Merrimacook could be a town completely built around ballet. Ballet could be, and everyone's a ballet dancer. Could be. I highly doubt it, but it could be. <laughs> Next up, we have our Donut Money donor for this week, and her name is Jennifer Hess. And Jennifer says, just a little donut money for the dogs and cats to get a treat too. I appreciate your comments about unnecessary dog shootings that happens too often during raids and other actions. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that's a few episodes ago. Yeah, yeah. don't shoot the dogs. No, you don't. Even if they're barky. There's no need to shoot the dogs. There's no need to shoot the dogs. There are other options. Yeah. I don't know, like, have, do they tase dogs? Oh gosh, I don't even want to think about this yeah. stuff. It's horrible. Yeah. So yeah. Jennifer, I don't know where Jennifer Hess is from, Matthew. Uh, I'm just going to take a wild guess that you might know where uh, she's from on this planet. Of course I do. Okay. Where's Jennifer from? She's from Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. Does she sell Kentucky Fried Chicken? No. Oh, okay. What does she do? She, in... she owns a dog shelter. Well, probably. That's why she's riding in. Yeah, she's very active with the dogs and dog she shelters. And, and she takes in dogs, perhaps, that have been mistreated by police I officers. bet you. I bet you if that's not a real job, I bet you that's probably one of her dreams, though. Probably. It's like my dream. Like, <laughs> just to have tons of dogs. <laughs> Justin would not like that. Like some people call it a dog shelter. I'd call it having lots of dogs. Yeah, right. <laughs> having lots of dogs. Oh, well. Thank you to our thank patrons you so much. and our donut money donors. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this week. Uh, thank you again to everybody who listened to the show, who tweets about the show, who likes the show on Instagram and Facebook and all those other fantastic things. And, are, are, and are, is the show on the other places? Like Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. I rarely use Twitter. Like I haven't used Twitter for a long time. Since it was taken over by what's his name, I'm going to call it Twatter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> That's it for this week. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye. Bye. Bye.